Hi, welcome to Beyond the Fundamentals. In this video, we're going to talk about how to deal with a Calvinist ideologue. And when I say how to deal with a Calvinist ideologue, we're not dealing specifically with exactly what to say to certain given responses, but better, really a manner of approach so that you can develop some better tactics and a better strategy of how to address a Calvinist ideologue. I think if you understand what you're dealing with, then through your own sense-making and creativity, you can best develop a mechanism for how to deal with and respond to a Calvinist who is presenting you with arguments that you may not otherwise be prepared for, if you can understand where, how, and why they're coming from. So that's what we want to do in this video. As we get going, I want to say thanks so much to everybody who has responded recently and in support of this channel, financial support of this channel. It's been a huge help. It's uh, making it possible for me to film this video and hopefully the next couple videos that are coming up. So thanks to everybody who's done that. If you feel like supporting this, uh, this channel and you want to see some more content like what we produce here, uh, please see details in the, in the description below this video for that information. Um, what I wanted to do with this video was get into a discussion. I want to compare a few things with what the Bible says about dealing with people and providing answers to people. And then I want to compare it with a book by Peter Boghossian and James Lindsay about uh, how to have impossible conversations, specifically chapter 7. But instead of getting right into that, I first need to get into... We need to have we need to lay a biblical foundation for a few things, okay? So the Bible says, let your let your speech be always seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Okay. It also says that we need to be able to give a, uh, an answer for the hope that lies within us. And then we have some guidance in Proverbs for um, not taking the premise, not swallowing the premise. In other words, answer a fool according to his folly. Uh, don't answer a fool according to his folly, lest thou be like unto him, or answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. And one of those is to not take, to not answer a fool according to his folly is to not answer somebody based on the, on their own false premise. Spot the false premise, identify that premise, and then provide an answer that does not accept that false premise. Or the very, the next verse right after that, Proverbs Proverbs chapter 26, verse 4 and 5, I think is where that is, is to go ahead and take their false premise and kind of give a satirical answer based on the false premise to expose the bad false premise, to answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. So you don't want to make the same mistakes they're, mistaken, they're making, and but you may want to take the premise and expose it by using satire, which Jesus does a lot of times. So there's, there's a lot of guidance for how we need to talk to people. What I want to do before we actually take an examination of chapter 7 of How to Have Impossible Conversations, that chapter deals with how to deal with an ideologue. And what we do on this channel is we're dealing with Calvinistic ideologues. So we're going to see if there's something that we can pull some practical things that we can learn from how to deal with an ideologue. But what I want to do first is lay the groundwork. So I'm going to make this a two-part video um, <laughs> or two videos. I'm going to split this approach, th this attack vector into two different videos for, for the sake of time. And this video is going to cover things that you need to bear in mind so that you can understand where I'm coming from in the next video. So bear that in mind as well. So you want to keep, keep an eye out for that one to come out. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel, hit the bell icon, all that kind of stuff. So you're notified when we release new videos in, in this video. So what I want to do here is I want to look into Mark chapter 5 and I'll, at the guy who's possessed with the devil, with the legion, and I want to compare that to ideological possession, and I'm going to show you why we're going to do that. And at, once we understand ideological possession from a biblical framework and our necessity to be able to address ideological possession, then we can go into the next phase of the specifics and tactics. Now, what I don't want us to do is when some people come to this channel and they see that we refute Calvinism and they want like one for one answers, like a Calvinist says this and I want to be able to refute that argument with this. Well, you're committing the same problem. You're really, you're retaining the same premise that got them in the problem in the first place. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou be like unto him. If you just see something from a Calvinist and you're trying to fight back with a reciprocal 
answer basically on the same level to prove them wrong, you you wind up not seeing the big picture and you you exacerbate the problem rather than do anything real about it. All right. And an example of this made me want to uh, I saw an example of this recently dealing with uh, John chapter 17, verse 9, where even people going against Calvinism make the same mistakes Calvinists make because they're still seeing it, bearing in mind the false paradigm, taking the false premises. So we're probably going to do another video on that coming coming up soon. And so, so what I, what I want to do is be able to step back from the tit for tat, kind of going back and forth one paradigm against another. Their problem is they're running a script. They're running, they have like a flow chart of answers and, and it's not real thinking, it's simulated thinking. Nobody is actually, when you're doing simula simulated thinking and running a flow chart of somebody else's answers, it's just like a non-thinking, not really intelligent computer just running a program that somebody else wrote. And that's what we want to get away from. And in the game A, rivalrous dynamic with one set of ideas, rivalrous against another set of ideas, it's just two scripts running and, and they're vying for superiority based on the preparation time and the audience and the understanding level and that sort of thing. And I do think that you know, the biblical view does win out over the Calvinist view, even in a game A mindset. But I want to step up, step back and step up and understand things from the meta perspective, from the, from the level above. Um, detach yourself from the paradigm, from the ideology, as if it is not your problem, as if you're not identified with it, as if it doesn't affect you one way or another at all, any way you look at it. And then look at the ideological possession with that perspective. So you should be able, what I want you to be able to do is to be multi-perspectival to where you can understand maybe one, two, three, six, seven different perspectives on a matter without feeling like you have to commit to any one of them, okay? And without feeling threatened if someone happens to mention one that you happen to not agree with, or if they seem to have pretty good reasons for one that you happen to not agree with. One of the things that really hurts our sense-making is, is <laughs> to be personally identified to a particular narrative, to a particular paradigm. And then that gives us a bias. So what I want to do is be able to back off a little bit and look at the sense-making system as a system to see if it has any flaws before we consider any of the specific information that it is processing. So we're gonna that's what's what we want to try to do. We're gonna have a series of videos coming soon with it deal with that. We're gonna go to the Beyond the Fundamentals website and we're gonna we're gonna look at what the about us page says for our values. And we're going to walk through that, and I'm going to be asking basically to put together a wiki with your input on what would constitute, how we could revise that to make a good what our value statement is. How do we conduct good sense making from a biblical standpoint? Um, so bear that in mind. We're going to be doing that in the future too. And if you want to contribute to that, I'd very much love to have your participation. So stay tuned for that. Now let's deal with this issue at hand. In the Bible, I'm going to show. I'm going to tell you why I want to use Mark chapter five. The Bible uses patterns, and I, I have a new setup here. I have a monitor over here by the camera. So if you see me looking off in this direction, it's because that's where my notes are there, and it could be because there is a fly or a lizard, which has happened here. But but it's probably because my my notes are here. The Bible uses patterns. We see in Titus 2.7, 1 Timothy 1.16, Hebrews 9.23. The Bible uses parables, and I have the passages there. And I know, I know you know Jesus uses parables, but the, the Old Testament references and the one that I have from Matthew there are very interesting. So take a look at those when you get a chance. And the Bible uses similitudes. And we would say like a simile where you use like or as. The Bible also uses metaphors, that sort of thing. And that list could go on and on and on. But it uses what we might call abstract pattern replicators. And that is a meme. A meme is an abstract pattern replicator where one pattern of things is like another pattern of things. So reality is fractal. For example, it, with atoms, you have a nucleus to the atom, and then you have things rotating around the nucleus to the atom. That's kind of like our solar system. We have 
you know, there's a, there's a replication of things. If you look at a cell under a microscope, like a single cell out of your body that's alive under a microscope, and you see all the different things moving around in there, it looks a lot like if you were to fly over a city and look at a city and look at all the cars going everywhere, what everything's doing. And a cell is that complex. So th- when I say things are fractal, the same pattern of behavior is replicated at large and small cells. Now, if you Google that, you're going to come across these articles that say the universe is not fractal. And what they, what those articles are talking about is multi-universes. And that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is replicated patterns at various levels of largeness and smallness and replicated across time and in nations, and in international relations, and in group dynamics, those kinds of things are all fractal. There are patterns everywhere. Like um, Jephthah, Trump, Donald Trump is Jephthah in the Bible. That is the pattern. Marduk from the, from the Mesopotamian um, myth is, is Jephthah. It's the same story. It's the same basic pattern of the story, okay? Okay. Um, so you can birth order characteristics, those kinds of things. There's certain patterns you see in scripture. Uh, for example, you see brothers where the older brother is supposed to get the birthright, but the younger brother supplants the older as being either better or more worthy or gets the birthright instead. That kind of thing happens multiple times. Um, you see a bad before good pattern in scripture, like Saul comes before David, the black raven comes out before the white dove comes out of the ark. The Antichrist, at the, in the end times, the Antichrist is going to come before Christ comes in the second coming. Um, you see Hitler preceding the creation of the United Nations. It's a poor example, but it's a sufficient replicate pattern of the Antichrist preceding the unified messianic kingdom that's going to come. It's going to be the same pattern. These patterns are replicated, you know, in the book of Job, speak to the earth and it shall teach thee. So (laughs) go to the ant, thou sluggard in Proverbs, consider her ways and be wise. God has set things up on planet earth in history and in time. And if you examine things scientifically and just the animals to where we can learn things from them, if we look at them and try to understand the abstract patterns that are being presented to us. And Romans chapter 1, verse 19 and 20 says, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And people usually take that argument for a moral indictment against people that the, the them in the us and them we're better than you. And here's a verse. Okay. I'm talking about taking away the excuse of the reprobate, that kind of thing. Well, forget that for a second and just think about the comparison issue here. The invisible things of him, of God from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made. Now you look back at the patterns, parables, and the similitudes and the fractals and the metaphors in Scripture, um, God will present something to you and say, well, do you understand this? And you're like, no, I don't understand that. I said, well, it's like this. Oh, I understand that. I do understand that. And so that's, parables are like that. Do you understand the kingdom of heaven? No, I have no, no, I don't understand that. Well, the kingdom of heaven is like this. It's a simile. It's a using a story, using a narrative to try of something you do understand to try to enhance your understanding by comparison of something that you don't understand. And the Bible is full of this kind of stuff. So what I'm going to do with Mark chapter five is we go back to this concept of a meme being an abstract pattern replicator. Okay. Now, the way I'm going to use Mark chapter 5, the identification and application of an abstraction of a biblical narrative should not be mistaken for an exegetical interpretation of that narrative. So what I'm about to do with Mark chapter 5 is to apply an abstraction of Mark chapter 5. It is not intended to be an exegetical interpretation of Mark chapter 5. And I, I need to be very clear on that, because if I don't say that, a lot of you are going to get upset with how I'm about to use it. That's not what it's trying to say. You're interpreting allegorically. I'm not interpreting allegorically. I'm applying abstractly. That's what I'm doing. It's very, very different, okay? Um, I, I believe that the events in Matthew chapter, in Mark chapter 5 occurred in, in history as they are given to us, as the facts are laid out. I think that is literally what happened. But I also think that there are things that we can learn from that. Now, the Bible, you need to understand the power of a story. 
an, a narrative, a story is a way to, it's, it's a form of data compression and data transmission over time, okay? So if I were to sit down a young man and tell him a thousand different facts, he probably would not remember all of them. But if I tell him a short, simple story with a few key points, he can probably remember that. And then from that narrative, you can extract all 1,000 of those facts. That's the beauty of a narrative, a, a, a mythopoetic story. And when I'm using the word myth, I'm not talking about myth as in false. I'm talking myth as in eternally applicable. That's how I'm using the term mythopoetic there. And so we see narratives in Scripture. And the narratives, while according to the literal historical grammatical interpretation of Scripture, we understand that these narratives did happen as as they are given, but they're also given to us because in the narrative, there are lots of lessons, lots of, you might say, morals of the story, if you will. And it's, it, it's inexhaustible. It's absolutely inexhaustible and applicable to any time period. And it's, you can continually unpack these narratives for morals of the story and truths that you'll find in them. So that's what we're doing here. We are applying abstractly, not interpreting allegorically. So I want, you to, I want to be very clear on that. So let's go to Matthew chapter, uh, Mark, I'm sorry, I keep saying Matthew. Mark chapter 5, starting in verse 2, and we're looking at through verse 17. And when he, so I want you to understand this narrative, and I have certain things highlighted in blue on this slide, and then we're going to talk about the things that are highlighted in blue. So just in case you're not familiar with the story, here's what happens. And when he, he, that's Jesus, when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains." Because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when Jesus saw afar off, but when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him, and cried with a loud voice, and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. (laughs) That's interesting. He, them. Now there was nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding, And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave. And the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about two thousand, and were choked in the sea. And they that fed the swine fled, and told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that was done. And they come to Jesus and see him that... And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting in the clothes and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil. But here's how the story happened. And also concerning the swine. Here's what happened to the pigs afterwards. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coasts. <laughs> Please leave, Jesus. We don't want you here anymore. So what I want to do is break this down, and we're going to look at this demon-possessed person, this person who is possessed with the devil, is what the Bible actually says. The word demon possession is not in the King James Bible. The word demon is not in the King James Bible. It's already it's always translated as the word devil, okay? And that's very interesting, because the Greeks had this idea of a demon that could be a good thing, too, like Socrates believed he got ideas from his demon or daemon, depending on how you pronounce it. And you see that word in scripture in the Greek, but the English translate, they never translated it as, that's not to translate it. If you were to see the word demon, that's not a translation. That's a transliteration. That is to say the word in English at close to what it appears to sound like in Greek. Okay. So when you see the word demon in a Bible translation, that's a non-translated word. 
to translate the word, it's translated as devil in the King James Bible. So there's a difference between transliterating and translating. You need to know the difference. Transliterating just renders the word the way the same phonetic sound into the other language without actually translating the word. So we're looking at, what we're going to do is we're going to compare being possessed with a devil with being possessed with an ideology. And on this channel, we deal with Calvinism a lot. So we're going to deal with being possessed with the ideology of Calvinism. But I also want you to understand that being possessed with any kind of ideology could be used the same way. Okay, ideological possession. Like Carl Jung said, people don't have ideas. Ideas have people. Jesus uh, compared in his parables, he said the people were like soil. They're like the ground, if you will. And you can sow some seed over here and some seed takes it and some seed doesn't. And people are like the ground. Um, (laughs) And so you as soil could have a seed planted in you that is growing and taking root. And especially if it affects your mind, you don't have the wherewithal to turn it down and say, no, I don't like that. It just grows in you as soil. Just like soil can't really decide what gets grown in it. That's kind of like how it's kind of frightening. It's kind of passive. It's kind of frightening. So that's taken captive by the devil at his will, that kind of thing. So with that in mind, let's break down some of the blue things. I highlighted these things in blue. As you can see, then we're going to look at all these phrases in the blue. And those phrases are a man with an unclean spirit dwelling among the tombs. Neither could any man tame him cutting and uh, crying and cutting himself with stones. What have I to do with thee? Jesus, thou son of the most high God, come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. My name is Legion for we are many. Send us into the swine that we may enter into them. And then was possessed with the devil and had the legion and they were afraid and depart out of their coast. Those are the phrases that we're going to look at. And we're going to look at an abstract pattern replication of ideological possession Um, on this narrative. So the man with the unclean spirit, this can be analogized as a person who is ideologically possessed. The idea has them. They don't have the idea. People are like soil, Matthew 13, Mark 4, and Luke 8, in which unwanted seeds can take root in the soil. So a man with an unclean spirit be like a person with an unclean paradigm, unclean ideological possession that has him. So he's dwelling among the tombs. It's interesting here that Calvinists refer to unsaved people as totally depraved and dead, and they like to they they bring that across as it's literal, but you don't ever see them out in the tombs evangelizing. <laughs> okay, so what's the parallel here? Those who are ideologically possessed concern themselves with the carnal, dead, lower order hypothalamic functions of people. They spread themselves, the ideas spread themselves across the people like kudzu, and we'll get to that in a second, based on fear, disgust, and scripted hypermorality, hypermorality narratives, all right, and post hoc rationalizations, rather than people who are alive and awakened to higher order functions of wisdom. And you can read more about higher functions of wisdom in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and 3, as opposed to carnality, okay? Neither could any man tame him. Now, an ideology has a life of its own, and its spread cannot be easily stopped. If you look through history, a lot of people get killed just because they have a certain ideology. But you still can't stop it. So it spreads across the soil like kudzu. It can seem humanly impossible to contain. Now, you might not know what kudzu is. So here's a photo of kudzu. And I've seen places exactly like this. There was a place full of kudzu like this in a field right next to my grandfather's house in Arkansas that we used to go visit when I was growing up all the time. And kudzu just absolutely takes over everything. It grows all over everything. And that's what an ideology can do. It will grow everywhere that it is allowed to grow. And depending on what kind of preservation memes and propagation memes and protection memes that it has to, to protect its central meme, it can grow and spread fast and crazy and overcome a lot of unprotected soil. This next phrase, crying and cutting himself with stones. People who, are ideo- people who are ideologically possessed cling to a set of ideas that ultimately the ideas hurt them. Now, the ideas are harmful to the host the same way that a parasite is harmful to a host. So it's, it's a form of unwitting self-harm to hold an idea that results in your own harm. 
Um, this next phrase, the guy who's possessed says, what have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? So ideologically possessed people can be correct twice. <laughs> they can be correct and retain, they can retain some propositionally correct content. I have a correct proposition. I believe that, da, 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 da. I believe that cats have teeth and dogs have fur. I mean, they can state true things. And this guy, state, he, under, he recognizes who the Son of God is. So somebody who is ideologically possessed can, will have some truth in the content. Like, like a broken clock can be correct twice, twice a day. Any, ideolo- any ideology will have some truth in it to which its captives can appeal in its defense. Now, the captives essentially have Stockholm Syndrome, where they love that which keeps them captive. And you see 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 26. And when I put these references up here, please look through them and read them, okay? Because they're very interesting. Um, so, someone who's ideologically possessed will have some truths in, mixed into their ideology. They will say some correct and true things from time to time. Otherwise, why would anybody buy into it? <clears throat> so, he says, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. Now, if you look in the context, back in verses 7 and 8, it says, He cried with a loud voice, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee, thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. So it kind of looks like Jesus already said, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And then that's the guy's response in verse 7. So for being because he said unto him. All right. So, and then even if it, happened in the order that it appears in the text rather than how the narrative seems to read. Still, he doesn't come out right away. The unclean spirit does not obey right away. It has a will of its own and it bargains. So a captivating ideology will bargain with its host when the host begins to wise up to the captivity. So say you're possessed with ideological possession and you start to wise up like I... I no longer want to believe this. And then your mind's going to be like, oh, well, what's Brother Melm's going to think of you then? You see? Well, what about the so-and-so? They really helped you out, and they helped you when you were in a hard time. You can't just abandon them and now believe something different. You see? So the, your, the ideology that has you captive will start to bargain with you. So you want to watch out for that. <clears throat> My name is Legion, for we are many. That's very telling. Now, this is very, um, if you were to get the book, I think Ann Coulter put out a book years ago by Demon, uh, called Demonic, and she uses the same narrative to explain political activism, how political activists get together and act as a mob, as, and they kind of move about as a single demon. And that's, that's a very interesting perspective, and I... When you look at the abstraction of a narrative, I don't think that's a bad perspective. It's a very useful and helpful perspective. And along that kind of line, Calvinists see themselves as among the great giants of the faith. There's, they, they think, they see that when I buy into this ideology, there's a lot of us. That's what they think. That's what they see. And to them, that has the same power of like a consensus has, a conformity to, a, to normalize what an in-group has. It, there is security in holding an ideological position that a lot of people also happen to have. And that's, that's pictured, it's demonically pictured here. So Calvinists see themselves as among the great giants of the faith or as part of a long line of rich tradition of faith. These are actual phrases Calvinists have used with me. And in line with all the greatest theologians who wrote the most enduring systematic theologies. All, all the best systematic theologies were written by Calvinists. Okay, so they see themselves as part of that group of a lot of people. And, and the number, the number is impressive to them and convinces them. And that's something that the ideology uses to take these people captive. Okay, and make them think that it's a good thing. Um, so there's a lot of appeal there's a lot of appeal to social, moral, educational, mentor, relational, and religious in-group pressure to a much greater degree than the appeal of the content itself of the in the content of the ideology itself. So the content of the ideology itself is not really that appealing, but all this in-group conformity pressure to the social, moral, educational, the mentor, all that kind of stuff is actually 
more compelling to be within this paradigm, to be possessed by this ideology, than the content of the ideology itself. So they said, send us into the swine that we may enter into them. Now, when you're reading through this, you might forget that um, swine are forbidden to Jewish places. Um, they're forbidden to be eaten. Forbidden in Jewish law. Look in Leviticus 11, Deuteronomy 14. So having swine to begin with was already a sin according to Jewish law. So wh- why do they have them to begin with? All right. So unclean spirits, unclean ideologies, if you will, they approach at an arena in your life that is vulnerable due to sin, usually willful sin, in the life of the host. So you have the Jews and they have these pigs. They're not supposed to have these pigs. So that is an area that these demons want to get into. These devils want to get into these pigs. And if you have something in your life that you're not supposed to be doing, that is an inroad for ideological possession can take an avenue of approach through that thing to get into you. So you want to watch out for that. Now, the comparison to the pigs here is very interesting. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 22, But it's happened unto them according to the true proverb. Talking about the context, 2 Peter 2, 22, is people who learn the truth but turn back to error. Okay, so But it's happened to them according to the true proverb. The dog is turned to his own vomit again. If you've ever had a dog, you've probably seen that. And the sow, that's a female pig, the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. So you take the sow, you take the pig, and you wash her, get her all cleaned up. And what she do, heads right back to the mud and slop and everything else, all the nasty stuff that you just washed off the pig. Um, a sow is a female pig. So this is a picture of a person who is given the means of restoration and rehabilitation, but returns to that which made them impaired and repulsive in the first place. Okay? So that's what happens. Now, this is going to tie in to later on when they're afraid and they get them to depart out of their coast. So bear in mind that reference to the sow returning to the mire, because that's going to play in key in just a minute too, in about two points. So this next phrase was possessed with the devil and had the legion. Now the phrasing there is important because it says was possessed, the person who was possessed with the devil. That's a definite article, single, like the devil has this guy and had the legion. And the legion said, we are many. And then later it says, possessed with devils. So how do you synthesize all this? So the definite article, the devil doesn't personally act as the spirit that possesses the individual. But what he does is he sends emissaries to possess the territory, like you're the soil, right? So he sends emissaries to possess the territory the same way a military commander can be said to possess a piece of territory after dispatching a unit of soldiers to conduct the actual possession. Now, I'm having a military background here, so we would send soldiers in to occupy the territory, and once they have it, you could even if the commander isn't physically there, you would say the commander possesses that territory, okay? And that's... The language here is like that, to where the devil possesses the person, even though he personally doesn't possess the person, he has emissaries that possess the person on his behalf, so you could still say the devil's got him, taken captive by the devil at his will. And I, I would go, definitely, I would go as far as to say that in addition to, and there's probably demons associated with this, but whether or not you think demons are associated with ideologies, the devil definitely sends out ideolo- ideologies, paradigms, uh, meme complexes, if you will, to possess people. Sends them out and they kind of grow. They take on a life of their own. They grow and they mutate. And, they, and you, even if they have a spirit, you know the devil has seed. And you could say that the spirit of the seed of the devil is being carried out in these different kind of ideologies that take people captive. And they were afraid. So this is the default reaction, especially of those who are still ideologically possessed toward those who seem to be unaffected by such possession. Like, the Calvinists will hold the great giants of the faith in high regard. Now, a person like me, I don't care about the great giants of the faith. I really don't care. Whether they're living or dead, I don't give a flip. I really don't. I will, I will take what they have to say. 
and I will separate the truth or the signal from the noise just like I would with anybody. I don't believe in being a respecter of persons, but Calvinists are very much respecters of persons. You know, Brother Melms, John MacArthur, and John Piper, and John Calvin himself, and Augustine, they hold these guys in very high regard. They're not acting after the similitude of God, is what James would say. They're, they are holding men in high regard. And so when they do that, and that's associated with their ideological possession, and you don't, that scares them. <laughs> They don't like that. They don't like that at all. And so then what they do, they don't understand that and they can't comprehend or explain and typically or what your viewpoint is, they can't comprehend it or explain it or explain why it's wrong. So what they typically do is they resort to verbally vilifying that kind of person, such individuals, by associating them with the worst examples they can conjure up as heretics and famous cult leaders. Now, this comes along with accusations of of elevating oneself above God for not being in submission to the legion of heritage of their ideological possession. So, if if you don't submit to Brother Melms, to them, you exalt yourself above God because to them, Brother Melms has the place of God. Brother Melms says it, they have to believe it. Whereas we conduct our own sense making, and if Brother Melm says it, I will separate the the noise from the signal, and I will take the signal, push back on the noise, and say, "Thank you. Have a nice day. It was fun while it lasted." So they see failure to submit yourself to their human idols. And they equate that to failure to submit yourself to God. And I had one recently just because... So when it comes to anybody in Christian history, I don't follow any one of them, especially not 100%. Now, some of them were more correct than others, but all of them had some signal and all of them had some noise. And that's to varying different ratios. And (laughs) so I'm going to separate the signal from the noise with all these people. So what they did is they will disingenuously represent someone like that, someone like me, by saying that you don't care what any of these people say. You you don't follow, you're, you're, you think you're better than all these people and you don't align yourselves with anybody. Nobody in Christian history has ever thought what you think before. I'm like, well, that's not a good metric of whether or not something is true, okay? But what those people should have been doing is separating signal from noise, and that's what I'm doing. I'm separating signal from noise, okay? So they're afraid, and when they are afraid, just like a wild animal that's, you know, because they're all hypothalamically driven, they're on the base level carnal In order to be a Calvinist, you have to be extremely carnal and unwise. So it's like an animal that's trapped in a corner. They start to get vicious and lash out with all these accusations. You know, you you don't, you you know, you you think you're better than everybody in Christian history. You're basically David Koresh, that kind of thing. They start accusing you of all kinds of wild things. You're just another Jim Jones. I'm like, well, I'm actually encouraging people not to follow me, to separate the signal from the noise, and to not believe a word I say until they check it out for themselves. And I don't think Koresh or Jim Jones were doing that. All right. So when people are doing that, they're they're just projecting the weakness of their own mind and the inability of their sense-making apparatus to discern truth from signal for themselves and to comprehend why you are where they are without admitting that they're wrong, which they would have to do in order to branch out into that arena of, of thought, of sense-making. So they'll lash out in fear. It's hypothalamic, it's carnal, it's base level, all right? Hanging out among the tombs. That's where ideologically possess, possession takes place. The base level, not, not awake, basically dead people, okay? And they wanted to depart out of their coasts. So even though something good happened... So Jesus, he helped the guy. He got these, you know, devils out of the dude. Even though something good happened, the sows um, are profitable. So the the people don't like it because the sows, the pigs, are profitable. People like bacon, right? They like to eat ham and pork chops and stuff like that. And so it's profitable. Um, Think of the human comparison here. Humans. 
who passively wallow in the mire. They're consuming, they're just passively consuming Netflix and video games and mainstream media and soap operas and reality shows and the products advertised on those kinds of programs. They are very profitable to the societal programmers. So if you're putting out Netflix content, you want somebody to watch it. If that person suddenly wakes up and realizes there is no utility in watching those particular programs on Netflix, that makes those programmers upset and they want to get rid of you because, hey, you're taking away their audience base. I don't have as many people returning to the mire after you help them with their sense making. So they want to get rid of you because you're helping people wake up and conduct their own sense making. And the same thing happens with like Calvinistic ideological possession. Somebody may have a, a moment of lucidity, but then the in-group normalization peer pressure pressures them back into acquiescing to Calvinism. And that's like a sow returning to its mire. And the more people that are ideologically possessed, the more of a fitness landscape you have to thrive well in that place of ideological possession. So if there are a thousand people who share your ideological possession, that's a lot better for you than if there are just two people that share your ideological possession. Because then it's just you two against the world. You'd rather have a thousand people on your side. So the more people that are convinced and have jobs and work and can contribute and give it to your ministry, the, the, be, the more of a hierarchy you have to rise up into, okay? So you need people in the hierarchy. So whenever you help a person develop, wake up to develop their own sense-making so that they no longer need the ideological possession, that depletes their fitness landscape, okay? It'd be like uh, cool, cooling off the Sahara so that the cheetah isn't as fit anymore, Okay? <laughs> And we won't go too far, too much further in that, but I think you, I'm hoping you get the idea. So if you if you introduce something that causes some of the people to permanently awaken from this aimless stupor, people lose revenue, and Calvinists lose um, adequate fitness landscape. The more people that depart from their ideological possession, and now they have to contend with the ideas on a more fundamental level, rather than just appealing to the hypothalamic urges of the masses. Okay, they actually have to get down to the weeds and deal with these ideas, which any form of ideological possession is not going to be good at doing, okay? So an easily impressionable crowd is much more profitable than a a disparate array of individuals all with distinct meaningful aim in their lives. So if you can gather all these aimless people into one ideological possession, you can make money off those people. But if they all have a distinct aim in their lives, you're not going to be able to enslave them or take them captive with your ideological possession. (laughs) So the last thing that I want to point out is when an ideological possession does not deal very well with first principles thinking. They don't deal very well with liminality, with having a liminal mind, with having a beginner's mind, with looking at things for the first time. Now, if you have a beginner's mind and they have a flow chart and they have their sense-making script that they're running that somebody else wrote for them and it comes up to any one thing, any one issue, The person running the script and running the flow chart is going to seem to have all the answers. They're going to be able to provide quick, fast, rapid answers and a multiplicity of answers, whereas the person who is conducting first principles thinking will comparatively look stupid to an observer, even though they are doing something that is fundamentally more necessary. Now, if I'm conducting first principles thinking, I may be, and I that person probably is smart enough to look at the paradigm. I can look at the Calvinist paradigm and I can answer all the same questions the same way they would. Okay. I can do that too, but I don't think the paradigm is true. So just because somebody can provide answers quickly does not mean they are thinking. It does not mean those answers are correct. What it means is they're conducting simulated thinking and simulated thinking appears to outperform first principles thinking, even though first principles thinking is what really needs to happen. Somebody recently asked, 
give you an example of this. So, so if you're in a debate, for example, a debate is not a good way. That's a rivalrous information exchange. And the person who appears to have the most fit answers or the most answers is going to appear to be correct to the mind numb robots who are sitting out in the audience and don't understand how to conduct their own sense making. Whereas the person who's actually trying to apply first principles thinking, they are doing the correct thing that is more epistemologically sound, but they will appear to be outperformed by the person who is running a script. So you have to bear that in mind. And look at that difference. Somebody recently asked, they made a meme of like the Pope standing there scratching his head and it said, who started coronavirus? Now I'm filming this in the middle of Corona land on April 4th. Uh, 2020. Okay. So we're in quarantine right now. And you can probably tell my hair is getting long. It's time for a beard trim and all that. But they asked this question, um, did God, uh, with regard to the coronavirus, does God not know what's happening or is God unwilling to stop it? Or is he unable to stop it? Or did, is he doing it on purpose? You know, what's God's role? What is God's role in, in the coronavirus thing? And my initial, res- a lot of people, they jump right to, they, they accept the premise. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest I'll be like unto him. And they start to think about what God's role is. But really, <laughs> my thinking on the matter is more like, let's stop the question a lot earlier than that. What is God's role in the coronavirus? How about what is God? Can you even answer that? You see? Take an ideological possessed person and ask them that. You see, you see how much you assume about God before you ask that question that you don't even know? Think about that. What is God? Let's answer that question first, and then we'll talk about his role in the coronavirus, or her role, or its role, or whatever you want to call it, okay? What is God? <laughs> what if um, you were to make an analogy where a computer programmer or a team of programmers creates this simulation, and inside the simulation, there are autonomous sentient beings who are artificially intelligent, but they are genuinely sentient, okay? And that simulation runs according to a certain program that the programmers designed, and they know all the possibilities. So, in that, in that scenario, what would be analogous to God? The programmers who set it all up and kicked it off, or the program that's running to which all the sentient beings are subject. Which one's God? Now, if you want to jump to quickly answer that question, you are conducting simulated thinking in accordance with a paradigm. The first principles way of dealing with that question is to realize the place of liminality that it can take you to and start to wonder and maybe even wonder and get curious and maybe even be a little afraid and feel a little uncomfortable about not being able to come up with a good answer. Okay. And you need to be able to come up. You need to put yourself, if you've been listening to our awakening, awakening the spirit series, you need more opportunities to put yourself into that state of liminality. You really need to be there a lot in order to conduct your own sense making. All right. You want to be able to conduct first principles thinking. We're going to end this video here, and in the next video, we're going to get to what I wanted to get to initially, which is I want to look at what Peter Boghossian says in chapter 7 of How to Have Impossible Conversations. Between now and then, get a hold of that book. You can get the audio book. You can get it uh, it digitally, and read that book. I I have it in iBooks, and read that. If you get a chance, we're going to be talking about chapter seven and how that relates to dealing with a Calvinist in light of what we know from scripture about how to deal with people in ideological possession. So stay tuned for that video and we're going to close this one here. Thanks for watching. May the Lord bless you and good day.